I'm thrilled to be joined by my coworker, Kathleen McCluskey, who will be co-moderating today's session with me. We're also here with Bill Tracy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who will be providing a short presentation as part of today's event. And I also wanna thank our co-hosts, the National Center for Appropriate Technology and the Vermont Law School Center for Food and Agriculture Systems, both of these partners have provided incredible support in planning, promoting, and executing today's listening session. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our partners. Next slide. We of course also really appreciate all of you joining us today and taking a break from your busy day to make your voice heard on how intellectual property rights affect you as a farmer, seed grower, seed saver, plant breeder, or however you rely on or interact with seed. Our team at Organic Seed Alliance believes strongly that IPR decisions affect all growers, regardless of how you farm or, or garden, whether you're organic or not, and that IPR decisions have very real ethical and cultural implications for seed systems. Now, with the challenges presented by the current pandemic and with the new administration taking control in January, we feel that it's more important than ever to create virtual gatherings for important discussions like this one, to ensure a more equitable and sustainable food and farming system, and to of course also inform policy recommendations moving forward. Today's listening session, Seed Commons and Ownership, is part of a series that OSA is co-hosting with a number of our partners throughout this fall and winter. Next on our calendar is a listening session focused on excluded methods in organic production. This will largely focus on the work of the National Organic Standards Board on this topic, and this next listening session will be held on December 16th. We'll also be hosting a listening session on GMO contamination in seed, and this one will happen on January 19th. Just wanted to get these two um, upcoming listening sessions on your radar, and you can find more information on our website at seedalliance.org. Okay, moving on to the next slide, we wanna make sure that all of you joining us today understands how to participate, in, excuse me, in the event. As you see here on the slide, there are three ways to engage today. First, throughout this event, you may type your comments and questions into the chat box and use this as an opportunity to connect with other participants as well. Secondly, you'll have a chance to provide verbal comments, up to three minutes. To speak, you will need to click on the raise hand feature located near the chat box as pictured here on the screen. We will be keeping a queue, actually it'll be pictured uh, on the next screen, excuse me. We'll be keeping a queue of hands raised and you will be asked to unmute yourself after your name is called. Our friends at NCAT are keeping a timer, so we will be keeping you two, three minutes. And lastly, at the end of this event, you'll receive a very short survey that allows you to submit additional comments that you didn't get a chance to share during the actual event. You'll also have an opportunity through the survey to opt in to sharing your contact information with the other participants that you may be chatting with um, throughout the event. Now, for those of you joining us by phone and you're not looking at a screen, you can still raise your hand to provide comments. To do this, you'll need to enter star nine on your phone to raise your hand. To unmute yourself, you'll need to hit star six. Because we can't see your name here on the screen, we'll be calling on you by your telephone number. So again, star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself. A couple more things we wanna mention before moving on. Um, we wanna be clear that this is not a Q&A. As moderators, we are not here to answer questions of, of you as participants or to discuss OSA's programs in this area either. We're here simply to create space to listen to you as a way to inform our educational events and policy recommendations moving forward. We again welcome you to converse with other participants in the chat box, and we have colleagues standing by to help answer clarifying questions as they relate to IPR. But please note that nothing shared during today's event should be taken as legal advice. All right, on the next slide, you'll see here uh, some more instructions for participate, excuse me, participating through verbal comments. If you aren't seeing the raise hand icon on your screen, be sure to click the icon labeled as participants. At, at the bottom of the participants window, click the button labeled raise hand. Again, we will call on you and ask you to unmute yourself when it's your turn to speak. And we will try to get to as many of you as possible. 
with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen to provide just a little bit more context for today's event. Hey, thank you, Kiki, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning or afternoon, depending on your coast. Um, before moving on, I want to just acknowledge that um, issues of IPR on seed are intricately connected to that of whiteness and colonialism in the US, and that today's listening session is occurring within this context. Um, I have just picked up this book by Dr. Anjali Vats called The Color of Creatorship, Intellectual Property, Race, and the Making of Americans. Uh, it just came out and I can't wait to dig into it deeper. And that's because by you know, examining these intersections and acknowledging and dismantling the white bias in IPR and SEED is paramount to developing alternative models that are built on democratized knowledge, production, and ownership and models that honor and center seed in the commons. So I look forward to continuing these conversations and this work with you in the seed community. And we at OSA are um, beginning the conversation and organizing with some other partners about a second IPR session that's focused and centered on that subject. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, but as for today, uh, in this listening session, we're going to start off with a brief overview of the various forms of IPR that can be associated with SEED. And to help us with this part, we're going to turn the mic over to our colleague, Bill Tracy. Um, Bill is a, a public sweet corn breeder from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he is going to lay a foundation for some of the terminology that we'll be hearing today. So with that, Bill, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, um, I should be all set. Um, so uh, it's great that so many people are interested in this subject. It's very complicated, a very thorny subject. This, I see somebody in the, in the uh, chat has already said this is a great slide. Well, in fact, um, this, is a, this is abstracted from an OSA publication. And I think Kat's gonna put the link to that publication in the chat box. This, I, I cut this way down so it would fit on a slide and there's a lot more information in the OSA, um, in the OSA uh, material. Um, so I'm just gonna go through this fairly quickly. Again, it's not a Q&A, but um, this should raise some questions that maybe we could answer in another format. And some of these would be answered by the, the printed version of this chart, which again has much more information. Um, so the first um, category there, uh, first of all, across the top, we have uh, various types of, of um, intellectual property, the plant patent, the Plant Variety Protection Act, which is also called PVP. And PVP is kind of the American version of UPOV, which is the European plant protection um, equivalent of PVP. I'll talk a little bit more about both of those in a minute. There's the utility patent, there's the trademark, the trade secret, and the contract or license, and finally the open source seed initiative. Um, and then the first uh, point is, are they legally binding? And basically they all are. Um, the legally binding part is that um, uh, for plant patents, plant variety protection, utility patents, and trademarks, these are, these are all, um, uh, federal laws that, that protect these ideas. Um, the trade secret is uh, complicated because it's actually where a company is trying to keep information uh, secret so that other people cannot get it. And in this case, it's generally used for hybrids and the inbreds are the secret. So if the inbreds somehow, uh, if the company somehow get, lets the inbreds get loose, let's say they drop some corn on the sidewalk, um, then it's complicated about whether they've actually let their trade secret loose. Uh, the contract is between parties and that is the legal agreement between parties. It's very binding. On the other hand, again, if one of the parties uh, somehow lets some of the material uh, fall into somebody else's hands, then the contract is um, uh, open to uh, legal interpretation. 
I will say that the contract and the trade secret and the trademark are generally used with the first three, the plant patent, the plant variety protection or the utility patent. And this doubles the protection. So if somebody does lose their seed, the plant patent, the variety protection or utility patent can uh, uh, step in there, if you will. And I'm taking way too much time already. I can see that. Um, what, what do plants, what does it do? The plant patent uh, covers asexually reproducing crops with the exception of potato. The Plant Variety Protection Act uh, covers seed propagated crops. It was originally founded for crops like oats and wheat and soybeans, but now it's used widely for most crops. The utility patent is the utility patent for a better mousetrap. It's the same patent. It is uh, can be uh, used for seeds of any kind. It can be used for clonal uh, leaf propagator material. And it's very, it can be the most restrictive. A trademark is a brand name. It actually doesn't protect the variety. It protects the name. So you really need to use one of the other things uh, instead. In plants, the trade, uh, the trade secret is usually uh, used with F1 hybrids. And the contracts are usually used with the other um, other types of protection. And then open source seed initiative is a pledge. I'm not gonna spend any time on the next line, which is how long does it last? Because that's pretty uh, clear. I need to go to the next slide. Um, so then is save, seed saving and or plant cuttings allowed? The plant patent, and I, then I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go right to the next point as well is breeding and research allowed. So for the plant patent, there are no exemptions for propagation and no exemptions for breeding. Officially, you cannot touch that material in terms of improving it in any way for 20 years. The next uh, type, the plant variety protection is actually the most uh, open. Farmers can save seed for on-farm use and breeders and other researchers can use that material to do research on and also to start developing new varieties. So that is the most open. Uh, utility patent can be highly, highly restrictive and essentially, again, uh, somewhat similar to the um, plant patent, uh, essentially restrict any usage of this material except for growing it as a crop. Um, the trademark, um, a bit more complicated here, but again, the trademark really doesn't protect the variety, it protects the name. Trade secrets, um, permission must be granted to use that material. And it's possible that a company might grant you that trait, uh, that ability. And you, um, you always have to have uh, permission to market a trade secret. Uh, and then the contracts are however the contracts are written and they can be highly, highly restrictive. These would include the categories such as bag tags and things like that. And finally, Aussie, um, uh, is much more uh, progressive in the sense of what uh, can be done with the material, but uh, any breeding or further development, uh, the um, pledge must be attached to that material. Finally, the costs are across the bottom. I'm not gonna get into those again. They're pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, um, could we go back to the previous slide quickly? Um, I wanna point up, out the very top line, and I didn't mention this at the beginning. All of these types of protection only give the owner the right to attempt to assert ownership. And that then gets very expensive. You need to have lawyers, you need to have investigations perhaps about how the material fell into the wrong hands and those kind of things. So the government does not enforce any of these things. You have to enforce it and then bring a lawsuit uh, based on the federal laws or the state laws that are applicable. Back to the other slide, please. Um, costs, again, that's uh, what reminded me of this. The costs along the bottom are to get the license or the patent or the PVP. The costs do not include the cost of, um, the costs do not include the cost of uh, enforcement. One other thing I really want to talk about is uh, on the next slide. 
and that is the so-called standard material transfer agreement. Um, and this is a result of the international treaties uh, on plant and genetic resources for food and agriculture. The aim of this treaty was to conserve and sustain the use of um, plant genetic resources. And an even more important aim of this treaty was to have fair and equitable sharing of the benefits uh, arising from the use of these resources and in harmony with the Convention on Bio, uh, Biological Diversity for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, so this means that when germplasm is accessed and exchanged via the SMT, which includes conditions for end use, conservation, and this is the key point here, benefit sharing has uh, ha, uh, goes into effect upon commercialization. It's, it's the key feature of, the, of this uh, treaty benefit sharing to the people who originated the material. It's also the key bug because we don't know who we are supposed to send the, the money to. And I'll, we'll go to the next slide and you can see the actual language. So this is, um, we'll go to the two um, orange arrows at the bottom of the um, uh, slide. Your obligations here are many, but most pertinent uh, is the following. If you commercialize a product that incorporates material provided under an SMTA and that is not available without restriction to others for further research and breeding, then normally you have to pay a fixed percentage of your sales of the commercialized product to the governing body. And if you get seed from the National Plant Germplasm System that was collected after 1992, you will get this uh, um, on your web page when you're ordering the seed. And it says, where that or big orange arrow, by accepting shipment of the requested material, you are accepting the terms of the SMTA a rec uh, a rec and recognize that your name and contract information, address, phone number, email address will be submitted as a recipient of this material to the governing body of the treaty. Then the assumption is the governing body of the treaty will be in contact with you. I don't know if that actually happens. I don't know how all of this happens, but this is the bug, if you will, of the SMTA. And that's all I have. Um, and again, I would really refer you to um, uh, the um, uh, OSA website for, for this document. Thank you so much, Bill. That was very helpful. We can move on to the next slide. As Bill just mentioned, um, we do have that more comprehensive version of the table. Not only has Kathleen put it in the chat box, but we'll also send it out via email to all of you participating today as part of our follow-up items. Now, we know that IPR is both a broad and complex, complex topic. I think we just saw evidence of that with the table. And to provide some guidance for today's discussion, we've come up with the following questions to spur some responses from you all. But needless to say, you should feel free to go beyond these questions as we wanna hear about your ideas, success stories, challenges, concerns, and other experiences that you've had with IPR. I'm going to quickly read through these questions for people joining us by phone. The questions include, how does IPR impact your farming operation? gardening pursuits, and plant breeding or research? What questions do you have about IPR? And what resources do you need? We'd love to know what resources you already have to help guide your decisions around IPR. We also would love to hear if you're a plant breeder who's used a plant variety protection, a PVP, or other IPR tools. What's worked for you? And lastly, have you or your community lost or secured access to culturally significant varieties through IPR. So with that, we're going to get started. Just a reminder to raise your hand if you'd like to share comments. When your name is called or your phone number is called, please remember to unmute yourself and put yourself back on mute when you're finished with your comments. Please also try to remember to lower your hand after you're through as well. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathleen to get started with today's comments. 
Terrific. Thank you. Um, as Kiki said, please go ahead and click on the participant button on the bottom of your screen in Zoom. To, and that will bring up the ability for you to raise your hand and uh, make your three minute comment. I will um, be keeping a queue of folks as best I can in order of hands raised. Um, I'll let you know when it's your turn to go. And I'll also mention who's on deck after that. So who will be up next? No hands. Um, Margaret Smith, you are the first one up. Why don't you go ahead? Please be sure to unmute yourself and um, we'll keep a time of three minutes to your comments. I just have a quick question that I had also typed into the chat. Um, Kiki or Bill, do you wanna discuss how licensing agreements compare and contrast and where they fit in in this legal list of of types of um, intellectual property rights. I can just quick, quickly say that the uh, on the top line of that table, there was the contracts and those are essentially licenses um, or licenses, a form of a contract. And as I said, the contract in itself does not actually protect the material um, because various, um, because the contract is just between two parties. And so almost all contracts today are associated with a plant patent, a plant variety protection, or a utility patent. Margaret, is there more you wanted to share about your experience, experiences with licensing agreements? Um, no, I just, I just want to understand where they felt, where they fell in this, in this matrix. Um, but also what's the, if they're not, covered by PVP, but only covered by licensing agreement, what's the legal recourse from the owner of that variety? Um, I, I know we kind of wanted to avoid a Q&A, but uh, quickly, what if I have a variety, for example, that may be a, a licensed to a, to a seed company, and it might be, um, there might be a contract between me and the seed company so the seed company has to do what I have asked them to do in terms of returning royalties. If it doesn't have a PVP or a patent, then that seed will, can go to the customers and the customers can then sell the seed or do anything they want with it. So the customers are not bound by the contract between me and the seed company. So without a PVP or other legal form, other of the legal forms, the contract is just between me and the company that sells the seed. Thank you. I have a question. This is Bala. I have a question on, on where Bill mentioned about this. Um, say the company has given the seed to someone else, but that someone else is not bound by the contract. So that means they could do whatever they want with that seed. Again, I'm not, as Kiki stated up front, we're not uh, legal consultants, but um, it, it's, as again, the contract is between the two entities and the third party may not be bound by the, um, by the, by the contract. The, um, the contract might state that the receiver of the seed, meaning the, the person who I sent it to, has to protect it. So maybe that person might be liable for letting it get away. But uh, I don't think the person who, um, the third party is, is, is uh, legally bound. But uh, again, we're not lawyers and don't really want to give that information, uh, don't want to give that impression. All right, no problem, thank you. Thanks for raising your hand. If you have some comments, experiences you wanna share, we'd love to hear from as many of you as possible.
Chris Wooding. I see your hand up. Why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and provide your comment, a reflection. And Almendra, you'll be up next after, after Chris. Great, thank you. Um, calling in from Canada. We're a small organic farm, 100 odd acres, and we do some uh, food. We mill on farm as well, but we do an awful lot of uh, germplasm requests from gene banks, both the PGRC in Canada and the fruit from the UK, specializing in pre-green revolution, sort of 1910, going back to the 1600s, and have a particular research bent on waxy wheats, wheats that were primarily used for uh, thatching. And our focus there is drought tolerancy with the waxy cuticles, as well as uh, carbon sequestration to help build our, our residual organic matter in the soil. Um, we've been moderately successful at a number of them and seem to be running into a stone wall with the variety registration list that while we've signed our MTAs um, and brought them in with phytosanitary permits, et cetera, we're now at the point of wanting to sell them and the variety registration seems to preclude us from actually selling seed because it's not on the variety list, which is the very purpose we're doing the bulking up and, and, and selection. So we're kind of at a end, end game. So we're focusing on milling and flower markets and, and other derivative uses, but it would be lovely to get some of this stuff back out into the, you know, small scale organic farming community. So. I'm not sure I have a question. <laughs> I'm kind of no, I'm just no, me. Carry on doing what I'm doing, and you know, if climate change causes catastrophic failure, or UG99 arrives in North America, then you know, maybe some of the grains that we've been you know working on will will come to fruition and be needed rather than um, sort of protected or hidden. Absolutely, Chris. Would you remind us again where you are in in Canada? Yeah, we're in Ontario. We're just across the border from uh, New York State. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much for sharing about, about that. Um, Almendra, you are up next. I apologize if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name. Please do correct me if so. You can go ahead and unmute yourself uh, for your comment. And next up will be Heron after, after that. Hey, hello everyone. My name is Almendra, Almond in English. Um, well, thank you. The, the presentation is really uh, organizing and it's, it's amazing how to see everything so categorized. I, I'm part of, I am from Argentina. Uh, I'm part of BioLeft. Uh, BioLeft is an initiative exploring, uh, experimenting with open source uh, licenses and uh, also participatory breeding. Um, we are part of uh, GOSI, the Global uh, Open Source Seed Network. And in that sense, I, I have many questions, but I think that the most important ones are the enforcement of the open source licenses and uh, also the business model, like how to make it sustainable and appealing to independent breeders and, and also small companies. And uh, my, my third question has to do with the registering of, of seeds. Recently, we have been participating in some, some seminars and spaces, spaces about seeds registration. And uh, we, we find it really challenging about how to protect or, or use open source seeds in the case of seeds that are not uh, stable, homogeneous, and that they don't accomplish with the three main characteristics. So we don't know if uh, creating new register, it's a, it's a possibility or if there are other ways to trace them. And, but, so I know it's really why I'm, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. You're on mute, Kat. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, all really great big questions uh, to, to dig into. Um, so I, if, if folks have responses that they wanna add in the chat, and also if you wanna 
you know, raise your hand and have provide some of your experiences, perspectives or knowledge base that get at that um, open source and some of the questions that, that she shared, please do raise your hand and pop or pop it in the chat. Um, next is Heron Breen. Heron, please remember to unmute yourself. And after Heron will be Jerry Hall. Thank you, Kat. Uh, just want to follow up a little bit on what Amundra said, which is uh, working with being, thankfully being blessed to work with some rematriation projects. Uh, it's very obvious that there's indigenous and original material or original plant material that has really incredible disease resistances. Um, and I am concerned about under the justification of climate change and all the ways that we constantly justify um, responding to our industrialized impact on the world, i.e. other communities, I am concerned that we are continually justifying more taking um, and also um, not tracking those things as varieties because uh, they don't qualify under much of the legal framework that we've talked about earlier on those slides as varieties. The government definition of variety is much different than what you or I might utilize in our language. Um, and so it feels to me like there's a lot of pressure to be seeking these stress resistant varieties in the world. Um, and it seems to me that we haven't tackled the ethical cultural element um, that we are sort of setting up rules to protect taking from those of us who are already in a capitalist legal structure, uh, but we're not set up to basically offer the remuneration back to, to people who are actually the originators of this material and the keepers of this material. Um, so it, can, it continues to worry me, whether it's in the GMO realm or the gene splicing or uh, CRISPR method, or just in the eagerness uh, to grab all that we can that might perform well. Uh, and that could be wheat from somebody's village uh, or town uh, or someone's, or, or a squash or a tomato or a wild plant. Um, I think sometimes we look elsewhere when it's something that appears to be European domesticated, we don't also continue to think about uh, those folks that have been stewarding that in the idea of remuneration. So it feels like this would be an opportunity for indigenous plant breeders to uh, be the ownership of that. Um, and I'm worried that, that this is going to be justified as more taking and sort of glossed over towards the quote, greater capital or greater community gain. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Heron. Much appreciated. Um, next up is Jerry Hall. And right after Jerry is Tessa Peters. Jerry, please remember to unmute yourself for your comments. Okay, uh, my understanding is that uh, UPOV and PVP are right now not in alignment and are scheduled to be harmonized, um, especially surrounding essential derivation. Uh, from what I've heard in, under UPOV, essential derivation, the accused has to prove themselves innocent. And under PVP, it's up to the accuser to prove the accused guilty. Um, be curious to hear what you've heard about any harmonization between PVP and UPOV. I've only heard what you've heard. I, I, they are not in harmony. Um, and there's work on harmonization, but um, there will be uh, vigorous negotiations. I'm not sure where, where it will end up. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Tessa, you are up next. And after Tessa will be Rochelle Harding. 
Thanks, Kat. Um, I was just going to talk about our experience at the Land Institute. We own a trademark uh, on the brand name Kernza, under which we market um, a perennial grain. And there are several varieties that can be marketed under the name. So this is just a kind of different way of thinking about intellectual property that does that uh, involves many different varieties and each of those varieties can be protected in different ways but marketed under the same name and um, the trademark licenses require that data because this is a new crop data being collected on different kinds of management practices and things like that so we can learn more about the um, agronomic and uh, cultural importance of the grain in the marketplace. Terrific. Thanks for sharing about um, the trademark experience, Tessa. Um, Rochelle Harding, which I think I might be pronouncing uh, incorrectly, you're up next. Uh, please do go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, um, it's Rochelle, so you're correct. Um, so I just wanted to share my perspective. I um, actually feel very unknowledgeable compared to some of you all. Um, but I work in community development and uh, for an organization called Valley Verde. And we basically address food insecurity in um, Santa Clara County, which is the uh, California Bay Area. And so our goal is to teach low income food insecure neighborhoods, um, people how to start their own organic gardens. And something that I really wanted to teach people was how to save seeds so they're not dependent on um, always having to purchase and just creating more sustainable um, practices and allowing the seeds time, uh, you know, over the years to develop um, the traits that make them withstand, you know, environmental conditions and such. Um, but so I'm an educator and, um, I don't know, I guess my perspective is just, is there any legality for teaching just your everyday people how to save seeds? Um, if we're not selling them, you know, on a big scale, what is, um, how does that impact us as we're trying to teach people how to, you know, become more self-sufficient and uh, grow their own food and know where their food's coming from? So that's my perspective. I appreciate that, Bill or Kiki, do either of you wanna to respond to the question about saving seeds in educational garden situations? If not, that's okay, Just give you a shot. Well, again, it's complicated and it depends on the varieties that are being used, but I think the main thing comes down to the question about whether they're selling material and that's when, mm -hmm. if they're growing it in their garden and sharing the seed, I don't think they've got much to worry about. Yeah. But if they're selling, that's when the, the uh, complications arise. Yeah, I agree. And I would just encourage anyone who is wondering about their right to save seed from a variety that they purchased uh, from a particular company pick up the phone and call them, ask questions, ask them questions, oh, forgive me. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, ask questions about uh, what, if any, IPR rights are associated with the seed that you purchased, purchased and are now using. Seed companies want to hear from their customers directly. And the more that they hear about these issues, uh, the more they'll re real realize that they're top of mind for some of their customers. Can someone comment about the seed saved from vegetables and fruits that you purchase in the market? Because I do tell students to do those things and, and use it from an educational context and we do grow plants out of it. But could somebody use those material? I can't speak to that. Well, again, it depends. Um, 
I could give you an example for um, which it really depends on what you're doing with it. If you're doing it totally for educational purposes, I don't think there would be much to be concerned about. But if you were planning on uh, selling something that you got from the grocery store, I'm thinking here, uh, this may not, this may be a crazy example, but uh, pineapples, you know, you can regenerate a pineapple by chopping off the top. Well, some of those uh, pineapples are, many, many of them now are legally uh, protected. And um, if you decided to start a, a pineapple business by doing that, then I think you would have a problem. But I don't really think that's what you're talking about. I think educational uses right. are not going to be much of a problem. I have someone, Kat, um, in chat who would, who wants to respond to this as well. Charlie Overbay, if you want to unmute yourself and. Thank you. Yeah. Molly, I, I can't comment from a <clears throat> from a legal standpoint, um, but from kind of a trueness to type standpoint, I'm I'm the same way. If I'm gonna plant beans or something or uh, or just anything, like why not buy it off the shelf, eat some, and plant some too? Um, but there's a difference between seed grade and food grade, and if you're buying something from a seed company, you're buying the seed packet, then it's going to be guaranteed true to type. But if you go to the store, so it's going to grow correct to what you purchased. But if you go to the store and buy a spaghetti squash and then save seed from that and plant it, yes, you are going to grow a squash. And if that's just from my own personal perspective, if you're just growing that in your home garden for the sake of learning and learning the plant cycle of saving seed, planting it, growing it the next generation. I don't see any problem with that. I do that myself. I'm super excited about seed and we'll keep bell pepper seed and tomato seed and whatever you can, whatever you eat that has seeds in it. Um, but on my own personal farm, I grow winter squash and I grow multiple different varieties that are going to cross pollinate all in one patch. So if someone, buys my squash and then plants that seed, they're going to get um, a hybrid or a, a mix, not a, not an intended one, but just because the plants, the spaghetti squash is crossing with the pumpkin, crossing with the spaghetti or the acorn squash or the zucchini kind of thing. So you're going to get a mix and it's not going to come true to type. Um, I understand. I understand that varietal mixture and potential problems of saving seed from grocery store material. However, I do find I, I I teach about all kinds of vegetables, and that's my you know speciality. And I find some of the rare vegetables. Uh, it's not very easy to get seeds sometimes, but I can get the material. I, I go to specialty grocery stores and buy things from a Mexican store or purchase items from a Chinese store, and then I will create the plants out of those seeds. Um, that's that's possible. At the same time, if I have to get the seeds from say ABRDC, the Asian Vegetable Research Center, then I have to get a permit from USDA. It takes sometime more than a year before I can get all the phytosanitary certificate and get the plants back. And uh, I'm just commenting for a uh, few things can be done by taking seeds from material, but perhaps not all of the different crops. Of course, there's all these problems with the genetics is gonna be there, all the heterogeneity, whatever we're gonna see. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I also see in chat that that Jackie had a comment about this. Jackie Plotty, if, if you'd like, do you, would you like to comment or add an add to anything on that on that topic? Sure, so um, I generally don't advise folks to save things from the grocery store. It is very common among community gardeners that I work with in New York City to do that. Um, not just for the issue of things maybe not growing true to type, but also just because of, it depends on where they're sourcing the things from, but there are things that are grown in a conventional setting, you know, there are, usually plants that are kind of very high maintenance and probably are not gonna perform as well in a community garden setting with lower inputs. So 
those are some of the reasons why, aside from also just like disease with things like garlic, seed garlic, um, a lot of folks seem to be buying garlic from grocery stores and planting them. So those are the issues why I generally advise against it, but also it kind of brings up the need of why it's so important to keep seed in community, especially things that reflect cultural foodways, which I think is what um, the question is kind of originating from, right? Find, trying to find varieties that actually speak to people's culture and the things that they want to eat. Thank you so much, Jackie. Appreciate that. Um, next up in line, I have Nico. And after Nico is Colin Curtin. Hey, I'm uh, Nico Angelbert. I run the platform Seedlings so that's uh, crowdsourced information on variety and uh, create kind of collective intelligence for people to to find better adapted variety. And I have a question on, about data and oftentimes, okay, we talk about um, the patent or PVP. Is there, I was wondering, is there a restriction not on sharing the material, but sharing the information of this given seed? Uh, that's a question we have frequently here at Seedlinked as we have gaining a lot of information on many different variety, but can this information freely circulate uh, instead of talking about just the seed, but the information of the seed. Um, I wonder if there's any answer to that. I know in the contract or licensing, sometimes there's um, wording that's not let people share information on a, on a seed, but um, yeah, thank you. Just thank you. Nico, word. before you go off though, can you, and Bill, I'll let you respond. Um, but Nico, can you uh, expand on, on the type of information that you're curious about if it can be shared? Are you looking at like, yeah. just what IPR is associated with it or? Yeah, like performance. Uh, yeah, performance about a variety that can be um, yield evaluation, flavor, but also maybe a picture or visual. Um, so from agronomic performance to flavor, I guess. Yeah, quickly, if it's, um, if it's a, again, and you need to have this information to answer your question, if it's, if it's an Aussie variety or something else that's completely open source, something from the plant introduction station from 50 years ago or something like that, um, then no, then you can do anything you want with it. If it's PVP, uh, PVP has an exemption for research. So you can publish research using that. If it's a utility patented thing, it's actually unlikely without permission that you should even be doing research on it. I mean, I, I'm not in favor of this, but that is the fact is that um, the way those utility patents are usually written is that research is not allowed. And um, now I know what you're talking about in terms of the vegetable work you're doing here in Wisconsin. And I think you do actually have a license from most of those folks to do that research. But um, again, you see the license coming in, uh, in co coupled with the utility patent. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, partially, I, I think I was maybe not precise enough, but for example, when we don't really do research, but it's just every grower who collectively share their performance, not doing specifically research, but, or it can be called citizen science or research, but it's mostly um, sharing information, almost like if you're sharing on Amazon after buying a product. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nico and Bill. Um, and Nico, maybe you could put in the chat box a link to Seed Linked in case people are curious to um, learn more about the platform uh, if they're not familiar with it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next up is Colin Curritan. Colin, please go ahead and unmute yourself and sure. go ahead. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I unfortunately have to run right at noon, but I'll definitely listen to any responses uh, in the recording. Um, I work with the University of Minnesota Forever Green Initiative, and so we're developing and launching uh, new perennial and winter annual crops for Minnesota and the upper Midwest. 
and I'm sort of tasked with some of the licensing and IP strategy thought development around that. Um, and work very closely with Tessa Peters at the Land Institute on Kernza um, and other crops. Um, this is more of a general comment and question, but I, one thing I struggle with is just um, how thorny and ethically complex this work is. And it seems like there's a strong trend toward increasingly exclusive licensing um, of new varieties, of new traits. Um, and I experience um, a lot of tension within different stakeholder groups around how they'd like to see new crops licensed. Um, and I think there's a subset within the intellectual property and varietal licensing community of folks that are sort of in this role, like Tessa and myself, that are really trying to do our best to tend to those thorny ethical quandaries. And I would just be interested in ongoing discussion with any subgroup that wanted to talk about that. Um, we, we have some growers in some cases that are really advocating for closed and um, exclusive licensing to sort of protect what they see as the potential of these crops to deliver like a true social economic and environmental benefit. And then we have others that are fairly vehement around IP protection and exclusivity as really being a barrier to adoption. Um, and so obviously there's no easy answers. It's specific for each crop, but um, I would, be very interested in continuing discussion with any subgroup um, that wanted to talk about that. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, if you're, if you, again, as part of the survey uh, that Kiki mentioned early that earlier that will be shared with all of the participants on today's listening session, you'll have an opportunity to opt opt in to share, having your contact information shared with all of the other participants as well. So Colin, you feel free to drop your email in the chat if you'd like, um, but also just a reminder to everybody that if we can continue these conversations beyond the listening session and you, we can definitely put you all in touch with one another if you fill out the survey and um, indicate that you're um, up for having your information shared. Thank you. Marianne, it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and put that survey in the chat box. I know a couple of people indicated they have to hop off at the top of the hour. So we might as well just, just post that now and again at the end of our session. Thank you. I also see a few people who have called in by phone. And I know that Kiki mentioned at the beginning here how to raise your hand or unmute yourself. And I realize that that might be a little cumbersome too, or you might have missed it. So um, if there is anybody who has called in who is not on the Zoom function and seeing the video, um, please do go ahead and press uh, star nine to raise your hand or star six to just go ahead and unmute yourself and um, provide your comments. But up next, I see uh, Laura Parker has uh, her hand up to provide comments. So Laura, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, hi, hi everyone. I just wanted to build off of the last participant and say, um, when I've th been thinking about kind of what materials and re resources I would I would like to see um, as a farmer, I'm also a, a seed company owner on a small scale, but mostly as a farmer, I've been trying to um, have some conversations with my farming community with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union about IRP issue, IPR issues and how that relates to some of their core principles, which is really supporting family farmers and, um, you know, preventing some of the consolidation and, you know, corporate controls that, that we are con often concerned of in that organization. And I think um, being part of a conversation like he was talking about for me, but then also maybe having some materials of how we can engage people in these conversations, because they are so complicated um, uh, would be really useful. I'm not sure where to take that, but I'm, that's something I've been wanting to reach out, um, to you all about. And I've been trying to also encourage certain policy issues surrounding seed 
um, within the farmers union, within the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union right now, and hopefully eventually I'll be able to take it to the National Farmers Union, um, where you know it's there's policies in place to support public plant breeders and open access to ge genetic resources and and also just and see our way through these complicated co complicated issues. Anyways, that's that's what I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. They are complicated issues and very nuanced as we are hearing from one another and as we heard from Bill at the beginning of the of the listening session. Um, quickly, or not quickly, but I, I know that Kiki has a, a received a text comment for someone from for Frank Kutka who's having some spotty internet connection. So Kiki's going to share that comment. And then afterward, Charlie Overbay, uh, you're next on the queue. And I quickly want to respond to Laura's great comments and questions. Laura, I coincidentally was just reading the policy platform for the National Farmers Union uh, yesterday <laughs> and um, for this past year for 2020. And they do have some great um, policy priorities and positions, I should say, uh, around seed, including GMOs and who's liable in cases of contamination and things like that. And I, I think there's a real opportunity for the other topics that you brought up around open access and, and um, other parts of parts of those issues. So um, I'd, I'd love to follow up with you afterward and, and share what I know based on my reading yesterday. Um, next up, Frank uh, Kutka has asked in the chat, some companies will not commercialize a variety without an exclusive license and PVP. Is anyone else hearing this? Just wanted to create a bit of space for Frank's questions since he's having some spotty internet connection. We'll just wait a, a few moments here in case anyone wants to respond. Over the years, we have heard about PVPs being used in a way that doesn't seem to be in line with the spirit and letter of the law. Um, and we'd love to hear any examples of that if you have them. And if not, we, we can just move on to other comments if people are on queue, in queue, I should say. All right, well, not hearing anybody uh, unmute and respond to Frank's really important question. Um, we can move on. If you do want to respond uh, and are feeling a little sheepish about doing so verbally, uh, of course, you can go ahead and um, pop responses in the chat, which might be handy for Frank, too, to be able to see. Um, so it I'm actually, so Charlie, you are up next, but I know that you're actually with Dave Christensen. And so it is Dave who's gonna be providing a comment. So um, please go ahead and unmute yourself and provide the comment. And then Louisa, I see your message and you will be uh, up after Dave. All right, it's right for you. You're going now, Brett. Yeah. Oh, I'm up? Yeah. Okay, I'm Dave Christensen in Montana. I just found out that I'm up. Um, I developed painted mountain corn almost 50 years ago. It's uh, bred from indigenous American Indian corns. The purpose is to be a stress hardy crop that people can feed themselves grain with. Um, it's being grown on every continent in the world right now, and I'm happy to see it spreading. I'm happy to see people adapting it to their local climates. However, um, the companies that I sell to the seed catalogs have been very good in protecting me as being the owner. They only buy from me and often other people feel the same way. However, there are people in the United States who grow my corn and then they decide to put it on the market and make money off of it and compete with me. Um, they don't ask me. Uh, they don't ask me if they can use my name, if they can use my genetics, they just do it. It's not hurting me too bad, but I need to protect my income. This is my only income and it's very small. When I select seed, I'll grow four acres and choose only the best 
1% or less seed to keep improving it. These other growers grow a much smaller amount and they don't understand selection and Indian corn can go downhill really fast. So it's, they're hurting my name, they're hurting the product. Um, there's not anything I can do about that. That is my history. I'm gonna move on to my current concerns. Also, I've been developing eight different lines of specific corn with the help of eight different farmers in eight different locations. And this takes 20 to 30 years. Perhaps I'll bring in a gene from the Amazon for nutrition. And it takes 20 to 30 years to get the genes out from the Amazon jungle that we don't want in the corn. And I don't get paid for any of this. And I have eight lines that I'm doing and I'm about ready to release most of them to the public. And I'm, I know nothing about protection. I'm wondering if there is some way I can protect it. Um, one line is high protein. Actually, it has a balance of amino acids that almost equals meat. So starving people around the world can live on mostly corn and get balanced protein. Um, another line that is the, my most important that I put the most money into and my partner has put tens of thousands of dollars into. Um, I'm not going to identify it right now. My, my partner is listening and if he wants to make this public, um, I'll leave that up to him. But just a few moments ago, I found out that a friend of mine has uh, marketed this corn he, he admits that he extracted the genes from my genetics and he put it on a public market and with selling it through a company, he beat me to the game. And uh, I don't think it's, he's not gonna try and block me from doing it, but he, he used a name for this corn that is almost exactly the same name that I was going Seconds. to. So uh, yeah, if anybody has any advice on what I can do to protect my work, I'm a beginner at this part of it, I have eight lines of corn I'm about ready to release. That's all I have to say. Uh, Dave, this is Bill Tracy. I would be happy to talk to you more about this. Um, the problem really is, is what we started off at the beginning with is that without um, anything you could do, you need to somehow enforce, which um, becomes expensive. On the other hand, it, it seems quite likely for a relatively small amount of money that you could trademark your corns like they're trademarking Kernza. You could call them whatever, Christensen's Montana Red or something like that. And you could have that trademark. Without a PVP, that wouldn't prevent people from selling that corn under another name, but that would, so let's look at your Painted Mountain example. If you trademarked paint, Painted Mountain uh, kind of the way that um, uh, Bob Quinn uh, uh, trademarked, uh, what, did he, what did he trademark, um, Kiki? Kamut. Uh, yeah. yeah, that um, then you could actually have protected the name and therefore if somebody was selling that, you could, you could ask them to stop and ultimately legal, legally have them stop under that name. But they could still sell the corn under another name. But it really, I think, one of the problems, and I, I have the same problem, is uh, when we release something totally publicly, uh, your name can go bad because people sell junk. And, um, it, and not, not intentionally, but it just changes over time. And um, very much the way you described it. So um, you could look at the way that Bob Quinn in Montana as well did the Kamut story. Uh, and you can look at the way that um, uh, the land it's done Kernza. And I could imagine um, you having one trademark for uh, Dave Christensen grown. That would be the trademark. And then you would have some stipulations under that, like it has to be. Um, but yeah, that, that would be the, that could be the way to do it. Uh, and that would be relatively cheap, but ultimately you'd still have to enforce it. But I'd be happy to talk to you later about it. Thank you. Thank you, Dave for your question and your comments. Um, and thank you, Bill, for providing uh, that input. Uh, Laura, or sorry, excuse me, Louisa Brower, you are up next. And after Louisa will be uh, Tevis Robertson Coldberg. Hello, um, can you hear me okay? We can hear yeah. you great. 
Great. My internet connection is not brilliant. Um, my name is Louisa Brower, and I manage a small seed company called Ferry Boat Seeds. We do contract organic seed production in Washington State. Um, I wanted to bring up that I was really concerned to see earlier this fall, OSA published an article about um, letters sent by BASF to small seed companies um, to sort of threaten them um, for growing varieties that had traits that BASF considers to be under its ownership. Um, yeah, the article of that piece, uh, just finding it here how patents threaten small seed companies. I found it really enlightening, also really disturbing. And I just wondered, I mean, I know we're not supposed to ask questions today, but there's um, some very knowledgeable people in the room. Is there anything that these small seed companies can do to defend themselves in this situation? And I wonder if moving forward, since it seems to be a routine thing that BASF is sending these letters out, um, would there be you know, some resources that could be put together and made available to help people defend themselves in this situation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Louisa. That's um, a really important question. To provide a bit more context, Louisa is referring to an article that Organic Seed Alliance published uh, through Civil Eats. And um, it came to our attention through, I believe more than six seed companies. Um, all of which are considered smaller scale um, organic seed companies operating at the regional level. They received letters from BASF, which is one of the top uh, six seed companies in the world, um, notifying them of about 127 utility patents that they owned on not just finished varieties, but, but genetic traits. Um, what we find especially concerning is that these are very broad traits, such as uh, disease resistance in a particular crop type, that we know uh, occur naturally, that um, occur in nature. And so it's, it's these examples of utility patents that we find especially egregious. Um, I, one thing we're doing, Louisa, is digging into some of these patent applications to better understand just what exactly they are claiming. I think that information will be instructive uh, moving forward, both in terms of educating uh, seed companies like yours and the broader seed community, um, but also in bringing to the attention of the Patent and Trademark Office just um, you know, some of these very serious concerns around the broad nature of um, many utility patents uh, being claimed out there. So I also think there's an opportunity um, for closer engagement within the seed community, the, the seed grower uh, community to um, identify not only more educational resources, but uh, actions we can take to try to impact some of these decisions and to um, really affect change even within um, the Patent and Trademark Office, um, including by finding some champions in Congress uh, for this call. This probably isn't a very satisfactory answer to your question, but just know that it's one that we are asking ourselves regularly and would love to keep the conversation going about what the needs and opportunities are, um, both in terms of education, but also in policy advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I think that's a fantastic answer and I feel so grateful for the work that OSA is doing. Thank you for the work that you are doing, Louisa. And thanks, Kiki, for providing some additional comments there. Someone asked um, to post a link to the op-ed that Louisa and Kiki are referring to. I did so, it's, it's on Civil Eats. It may be behind a paywall for you. Um, if you, I'll add another comment here in the chat that links to a blog post that talks more about it. Um, in case you aren't able to access that article. Um, next up is Tevis. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Please do correct me if I am. I'd also seen Myra Manning's hand up. So Myra, if you are still wanting to provide comments, you'll be up next. Hi, um, you said that correctly. I'm Tevis, I'm a small farmer in Massachusetts. Um, 
and uh, we're also we also are breeders, a farmer breeder, and I just wanted to echo a little bit of what Dave was talking about. We um, released a couple of varieties um, several years back that um, I'm was very pleased to see other seed companies pick them up. But at this point, I know that there are, I guess I released them a little bit prematurely. Um, and one of the varieties I know there's at least four different strains out in the world um, that, you know, are now completely outside of my control as the breeder. Um, I um, don't, uh, you know, I'm primarily a farmer. I don't have a significant economic investment in the variety, but it has made me hesitant to uh, consider releasing any more varieties that I've bred because um, it just, it's a, it's a slightly weird feeling. I sort of started out being all enthusiastic about, you know, seed should be free and everyone should share it freely um, until realizing what that really means and how, um, you know, there's just, there can be that disconnect where, you know, small seed companies can pick up a variety and that's great, but, you know, when the variety changes, but it still has the same name or in the case of the varieties, one was um, selected out of the other. And so, you know, I consider them separate varieties, but other people are selling them basically as a mix. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how to untangle that bit. Um, but it's definitely an issue that needs to be thought about and maybe it needs to come about from the seed companies, um, something like the safe, safe Seed Pledge. Seed companies need to step up and start committing to actually doing due diligence into whose variety it is um, and how to contact the originator of a variety, um, whether it's an individual breeder or an indigenous people. Um, and I guess the one thing that came up a while earlier was um, I was sort of wondering about, wondering about bag tags and whether um, they can be enforceable if they pass through a seed company to an end user, because um, that's something that gives me pause because I know um, a lot of seed companies are getting seed with tags that basically say you can't do anything other than grow it. Um, you can't breed or save from it. Um, but I never actually get that information myself. That's a great question, Tevis. I think it's really inconsistent. Maybe we could just take a moment to see if any seed companies on the call want to, want to answer that question um, or share their own protocols if you feel comfortable. Very none. Um, that's a really great point. It, what's coming to mind, Tevis, is and other folks who have shared about their farmer bred varieties is, you know, the need for potentially a resource that describes best practices, um, both for those developing it and looking for a fair and reasonable, appropriate IPR tool, but also for uh, the customers they're serving and the broader community who rely on the seed they're developing. Um, one thing I just want to mention before moving forward is that there's a great resource put out by our partners, um, one of our co-hosts of this call, the Vermont Law School, and in partnership with RAFI, the Rural Advancement Foundation International, which is a North Carolina-based um, fabulous nonprofit organization. They put out a publication last year about defensive publication um, and using defensive publication to establish prior art in protecting your independently bred variety um, as a way to protect it from that material being utility patented down the road, um, in, in particular to protect it from being utility utility patented down the road. Um, Kat or I will plug this resource into the chat box here, but we encourage you to read this resource um, as it encompasses a lot of good thinking and ideas around the role that defensive publication can play in protecting our scene. We have time for maybe two more comments, Kat, if anybody's thank interested. Thank you. There were some people Great, that thank you. answer uh, that previous question. Yep. I, yeah. yeah, I see that. Thanks, Bill. Um, and also, Emily has 
um, put in a link to the defensive publication resource that Kiki was just mentioning. Uh, Heron, I see that you wanted to respond to Devis's question. And after Heron, Myra, I have not forgotten about you, but let's just, I, I wanna take Heron's comment since it's directly um, in response to the last comment and then you'll be next, Myra, thank you. Go ahead, Heron. Yep, in general, those agreements are corp to corp relationships where it's naming the uh, the person who is, or entity who is selling the seed as the seller to the vendor. And that the, it's basically to, uh, basically clarifying that the person who's receiving the seed as a company is a vendor and is not going to be taking that seed and making their own production. Basically that that seed is for resale and not a stock seed for a company to create their own crop from. So in general, it's naming this relationship between these two entities. And in general, unless you as the customer sees that license, just as you would with software, you are not bound by that. There are situations where companies are asking uh, companies like Fedco or other companies to um, share that uh, restriction forward. And in that case, you would be bound by that. So in general, bag tags about 95% you know, of the time are basically clarifying corp to corp relationships. Um, so that's just the feedback that we've researched and the clarity that we have from our, mo like most of our suppliers. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Heron, for providing that perspective. Heron is with Fedco Seeds in case you missed that, his association. Um, he's also on the board of directors for OSA. Uh, and let's see next. Okay, so Myra Manning, you are next and we have time probably for maybe one, maybe two more comments. So if you do have something, please raise your hand or send me a chat and let me know. Uh, Myra, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just, I'm here from Row 7 Seed Company. We're based in New York. And just to answer in terms of how IPR uh, impacts our research, um, we really seek to maintain breeders' rights for any projects that we're working on or any collaborations we're building. And um, just to kind of follow up on these last few questions, actually, and, and um, is it's something that we've, you know, run into um, in the case of, of bag tags or, uh, you know, things that would be restrictive of breeders' rights. And that bag tag, as Heron mentioned, can be uh, passed on through a distributing seed company. So if that is the case, then yes, you know, anybody receiving those packets that had that same uh, information on it or language on it would also be subject to that agreement um, once they open the seed packet. Uh, and then the question, one question that comes up for me, just following on Louise's comment as well is, um, you know, is there any way of us knowing when a patent like that, um, you know, especially ones that are really restrictive of traits and really broadly restrictive are being considered? Um, I know that there's, you know, comment periods for uh, new laws and legislation, but I don't know if that's the case for, um, or if there's any way of us even knowing if a, a patent like that is, is being considered until, you know, of course now the information is accessible online that you can find them. But, um, but you know, if, if that was something that was possible, really would love to, to learn more about, um, you know, the ways that we can, can have an impact there and uh, wanna echo, just really appreciate the work that OSA is doing on that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Myra. Does anybody, um, want to comment on Myra's question? No lawyers on the call. Want to share any perspectives? That's fine. All right, terrific. Um, well, we are, we, we have about five minutes left of the planned listening session. I'm seeing no additional hands. Um, I am curious, Kiki, I think you might have one last slide. Thank you yeah, so much. I just thank you, Kat, um, so much for keeping cue. It's, it's a tall order. Um, again, we've said this six times now, please take our short survey. Let us know um, how this event worked for you. And again, you'll have an opportunity to opt into sharing your name and email address with other participants joining this event. 
other people who also, of course, opted in to share their information. Here on the screen, you'll see the other two listening sessions I mentioned at the beginning of today's event. December 16th, we'll be hosting another one of these focused on excluded methods in organic production, a very hot topic in the organic community right now, and one that the National Organic Standards Board has been working on for more than, gosh, more than six or seven years at this point. Um, and then on January 19th, we wanna hear about uh, experiences uh, with concerns around uh, GMO contamination in seed. So be on the lookout for updates about these um, listening sessions. Registration for the December 16th event will be opening up soon. Um, and as always, just be in touch um, with us should you want to continue these conversations or have any um, questions or ideas on how Organic Seed Alliance can better serve you and the broader organic seed community. Uh, are there any more comments, Kat? I just, I, I wanna thank everybody I, in the in the chat and just through our comments and, and throughout the listening session, as I already mentioned, and as we've already named, you know, these, these issues are very complex. They're very nuanced. And there are some very real um, cultural and, and racial uh, issues and concerns and impacts uh, interconnected when we're talking about IPR on seed. And so as you fill out that survey, as you digest today's listening session, if there are um, topics, questions, experiences that you've had that you would want to, to um, learn more about or share about on, on that focus of IPR, please reach out um, to either Kiki or myself uh, you can find both of our email addresses on our website at seedalliance.org or pop them into the survey. We're, we're really looking forward to hearing um, more from you and your experiences today and are looking forward to putting together and continuing to organize a second listening session or possibly panel that focuses on that subject. So thank you all so much. Yes. Thank you again to our co-hosts and Kat and Vermont Law School. And thank you so much uh, to Bill Tracy again for um, serving as an expert on these topics and providing uh, such, great, such a great overview early on today. So with that, I think we'll let you all go. There will be a recording available of this session. Um, we'll, we'll send that and some other resources to you all um, in the coming days. Thank you again, have a great day.